Past member uh, Clay Stauffer graduated from Haverford College in 1976. After a 19-year 19 da uh, daily newspaper career, including 11 years as publisher of the Holland Sentinel, he earned a B Bachelor of Fine Arts from Kendall College of Art and Design in 1999, and a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Chicago in 2001. He subsequently taught studio art and seminar, senior thesis courses at Kendall and, main to, main, and maintained a studio art practice. This is his third Hass course presentation. Well, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, thank you. thanks to everyone for not only being here, but being flexible. Um, I guess apropos to our overall theme of technology, uh, uh, I had to move this, I had to come down to North Carolina for a family event. And so I'm actually in North Carolina. So thanks to the uh, digital world, we can do this. Um, uh, well, let's go ahead and get started. But first, oh, I just wanna say, if you have any questions at any time, I hope you will uh, make them known to Ian and, uh, because I, I wanted this to be more of a seminar format. And uh, so don't feel that you have to wait till the end. And sometimes if a question comes up, it's something that I've neglected to, uh, to address or it, we just wanna go ahead and, and get the discussion going. And I have some suggested questions here or some uh, uh, questions that might prompt some discussion. And I hope to be able to deal with those or address those uh, if there are no other questions from you all. So having said all that, uh, let's go. As you can see, this is a three-part uh, seminar. Uh, the first one, we're going to focus on photography and how photography and the period immediately preceding the development of photography really changed the understanding of art in the Western world. And I guess I need to say in this time of ours when we're so fortunate to be able to uh, look at things in a global scale that we're really going to be talking mostly about Western Europe and the United States. And it would be great to uh, expand the discussion, but we had to, I had to draw some lines someplace to keep this under control. Um, so we're going to look at painting in the period before photography, primarily in Paris the development of photography itself and how painters, critics, and poets reacted to photography. And next week, we're gonna talk about light, motion, and sound, which constitute cinema. And then part three is the digital revolution and beyond. And I'm really looking forward to that, particularly because not only is that where we are, but it's, it's, it's a brave new world for all of us at this point. And nobody really has the answers to everything having to do with our transition to uh, digital technologies. So that's kind of the plan of the course. Um, here are just a few kind of to um, uh, situate some of these technical technological developments. Here's kind of an outline of a few of the, the bigger events that occurred. Um, lithographic reproduction, which actually was invented in 1796, uh, started becoming commercially popular in the early 19th century. And it really was a revolution and started, started the proliferation of images um, that before that had, images were much more costly. And, uh, and we've seen how in our time, images are I don't know how many thousands we're exposed to each day, but it's it's an incredible number. So we're, we're going to focus primarily on, as I said, photography today. But uh, as you can see in these developments um, that are listed here, a lot of them have to do with sound. And later on, uh, they have to do with uh, using motion picture photography. But let's first establish a context one of the things I think we need to remember is that uh, the industrial industrial revolution uh, was the sort of an overarching environment and it, it drove a lot of urbanization, it drove rising incomes, 
and this had a uh, this permeated throughout society of course we want to develop a sense of how photography altered perceptions of memory space and time and this is harder for us to understand and i think it presents it presents kind of a hermeneutical issue if you will how can we put ourselves in the shoes of someone in 1830 or 1839 and how would it feel to see uh, images for the first time, photographic images. And then one thing we really want to think about and focus on is how reactions to mechanical reproducibility, in other words, the ability to reproduce photographs um, to infinity almost, changed the nature of art and ushered in artistic revolutions and movements uh, throughout the late 19th century and into the 20th. So urban centers were growing. And um, uh, this was very important for, uh, um, for the arts. The Industrial Revolution was increasing wealth, as, as I mentioned. And in the cities, at least, literacy was declining at a pretty rapid rate. And uh, um, growing incomes meant that books and writing materials were accessible. In a more sort of philosophical sense, uh, the French and American revolutions had challenged ideas about government and the balance of power. And uh, the landed gentry, which had traditionally held the power in society, were under, under attack either in the French Revolution, of course, literal attacks, or just losing power. The Enlightenment gave more weight to subjective judgments. Um, the philosophy of uh, Kant, the writings of Rousseau, meant that uh, people were starting to look more at their own judgments and give their own judgments more weight. In the arts, Romanticism was superseding neoclassicism, particularly in painting. And in literature, uh, uh, Goethe's Sorrows of Young uh, Werther had been published and then revised. And in England, uh, Oliver Twist, uh, had been published in uh, 1838 and Balzac's Paragorio in 1835 and so forth. So you can really see that the world was um, in a ferment and uh, political changes, particularly in France, were, uh, were pretty tumultuous at the time. <clears throat> Fine arts, uh, Paris was really the, the center of the fine arts world at the time, Paris and London in particular. And in, in the early 19th century, history painting was the sort of the height of uh, the fine arts uh, spectrum. And if you were an art student in uh, Paris or London in uh, 1820, 1810, and you were ambitious, uh, becoming uh, uh, a painter of history paintings uh, would have been sort of a, a lofty ambition. And uh, I'm just going to quote from uh, an essay in Art and Theory. Uh, in the academies, the highest skills to be taught were generally those required in the pictorial stage management of history paintings. It was as it, I guess, an analogy for our time might be. Uh, some of our blockbuster films, uh, a history painting like uh, that of the death of Socrates by David was comparable to uh, a major motion picture. And uh, we'll look at the raft of the Medusa um, painted by Jerry Coe. And that painting traveled from Paris to London and crowds of people came to see it. And uh, it's hard for us to imagine uh, in some ways, although we do have blockbuster museum shows that attract a lot of people, but um, there were no movies then, of course, or television. So uh, history painting was uh, very important and at the height of the fine arts uh, uh, rankings. The status of the academic, academic genres had been declining as power and credibility ebbed away from the social and cultural regimes they tended to serve best. Instead, value was now increasingly placed on an unpremeditated response to nature. 
In other words, on the capturing of an impression. The 1824 Salon kind of is a really good case study on this because at the time um, uh, you had uh, the leading, one of the leading French painters, Angra, who submitted a painting, The Vow of Louis XIII, and Eugene Delacroix, The Massacre at Chios. And I think if you looked at these two paintings, um, you can see a, a radical difference. And it certainly stood out to those at the time. Uh, Angra dealt with a, uh, uh, an imperial event, Louis XIII's vow in 1638 to consecrate his kingdom to the Virgin in her assumption. Delacroix, on the other hand, uh, addressed an, uh, a really, what we would call now a genocidal event uh, in which uh, 20,000 uh, people lost their lives and the surviving 70,000 people were uh, basically put into slavery. So very emotional, completely uh, different compositions. Anger's composition is very, uh, very static, very elegant, um, not a lot of movement there. I think in Delacroix, you can see that um, it's, it's a much more uh, animated painting. And these were big paintings, as you can see. Um, so it was a big deal. <clears throat> um, so that prompted uh, the novelist Stendhal, excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink, to say in 1824 that we stand on the brink of a revolution in the fine arts. I referred to uh, the Raft of the Medusa, a famous painting by Jerry Coe. Um, Jerry Coe himself, who wouldn't live much longer, unfortunately, um, wrote in his notebooks that the, the French Academy, quote, extinguishes the sparks of this sacred fire, fire, i.e. creativity and inspiration. It smothers it, not granting nature the time to allow it to catch. So there was a lot of romantic, uh, reaction to neoclassicism. And in fact, um, before photography even arrived in 1839, the romantic view of, of the artist as hero was beginning to make itself known. And uh, in fact, in December of 1824, um, Count Saint-Simon wrote that, quote, it is we, we artists, who will be in your vanguard for the power of the arts is the swiftest and most immediate. We address ourselves to the imagination and to the feelings of man. And if our role today appears null or at least secondary, it is because hitherto the arts lack something essential to their energy and their success, a shared impulse and overarching idea. So the art world was in ferment. Um, and most importantly, I think for our purposes, the criteria of representation were changing. Uh, as we'll see with Courbet and uh, others, there was a type of uh, realism, an attempt to capture an unpremeditated, as we said, response to whatever was going around. The many more vernacular subjects and working in front of the motif. And here's something from the late 17th century, actually, by um, a French artist. But uh, this was all sort of in retrospect, almost preparing the world for photography. Here's one of Corot's paintings from uh, his time in Italy. It's, a, it's an informal uh, uh, motif, oil on paper, small painting, but still the fact that this was going on indicated a real change in aesthetic standards. So let's, um, let's move on to the more technological side of things. <clears throat> you probably all observed the camera obscura effect at some time in, you know, where if you have a bright, brightly lit outside, a or the curtains might be drawn inside, you might see on the opposite wall a uh, a projection of the scene outside. And so this had been known for centuries, going back, I think Aristotle noted it. Um, 
It was a well-known effect. Uh, Leonardo made detailed observations and wrote about it. And uh, a number of Renaissance figures um, explored this as best they could. And in fact, <clears throat> there's quite a controversy about whether uh, the Dutch painter Vermeer used a camera obscura apparatus in some of his paintings. And the, uh, the painter David Hockney uh, and some other critics and academicians maintain that he did. There's no real evidence, but the point really is, is that these apparatus were available um, and some artists did use them by adding a convex lens to the opening of a, of a, a small chamber. <clears throat> the real leader in bringing photography forward was a Frenchman, Joseph Nicephore Niepce, who died in 1833. He was a kind of an amateur scientist and inventor, and he began investigating the potential for recording images in 1822 using light sensitive materials, including something at the time called bitumen of Judea. And this was a kind of a low level light sensitive material. So uh, Niepce started uh, experimenting with this. And in 1827, he made this print or this image really um, using bitumen and exposing it for about eight hours. It was quite a long exposure. Um, and he called his, his result a heliograph. He happened to meet a man named Louis-Jacques Mandé Daguerre on a trip to England, and the two decided, and I think it was 1829, to collaborate on photography. And uh, Daguerre was kind of a, a jack of all trades in a way. He was a, a painter in the romantic style, a stage decorator, and a diorama creator, the famous Paris, Paris diorama. So the two began a partnership Unfortunately, Niepce died in 1833. Daguerre carried on his work. Uh, shortly before Niepce died, the two collaborators used a photosensitive distillate of lavender oil and obtained images in less than eight hours exposure time. So um, they were making progress, but it was kind of slow, as you can tell. By 1838, Daguerre decided to continue his investigations on his own after Niepce's death. By 1838, Daguerre was ready to seek financial backers and to reveal what he had been able to achieve. And so he um, enlisted the help of uh, a noted French scientist, Dominique Francois Jean Arago. And Arago was excited about it and brought this development to the uh, French Academy of Sciences. And on August 19th, 1839, at a joint meeting of the French Academy of Sciences and the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, this, uh, this was uh, revealed to the public, as it were, that images could be obtained um, in what Daguerre called a daguerreotype. And uh, as we'll see shortly, producing a daguerreotype was an elaborate procedure. Um, first, the uh, a plate had to be thinly coated with silver, then exposed to iodine fumes. You had to expose the plate in the camera for uh, at least 15 minutes. Then to bring out the picture, you had to expose it to uh, chemicals, fix the picture, and it was very fragile. It was a positive image and it had to be kept in a case or else it would um, degrade and tarnish. So uh, it, was, it was quite an operation. And, uh, but nonetheless, people were completely taken with the ability to do this. Uh, for instance, um, uh, one photographer, was just wrote about how, as you can see from the quote here, how astonished people were that they could 
see images of themselves and their loved ones with perfect fidelity, perfect, very fine resolution. That was one of the characteristics of the daguerreotype. Um, it was just a monumental achievement, but it was also, um, you can imagine that it might have been unsettling for some people. Um, and it, it was just, I'm sure, very eerie to capture an image like this after, for the first time in human history. In fact, you can imagine how it might have felt uh, to be able to have a reproduction of your your parents or your sister or brother, and and uh, particularly after they might have died or something as as a memorial. So Paris really went nuts over the daguerreotype. This is a lithograph from uh, 1839, and it might be hard for you to see, but I think you can see that uh, there are crowds and crowds of people. Everybody's getting a daguerreotype made. There, um, anyway, it swept Paris and spread around the um, the developed world. World. I want to talk a little bit, a little bit now about. Um, kind of the theoretical part of our discussion and uh, a, an essayist and uh, named Walter Benjamin who died in uh, uh, in the 40, in the, I believe it was early 40s, trying to escape uh, the Nazi occupation of France. But he was a student of photography and uh, an art critic, as well as an essayist. And he wrote a really important essay, and I can um, I can send out this link if you'd like. It's called "The Work of Art in the Age of Technological Reproducibility," and this essay has been really a foundation of uh, critical theory since it was first published. And Benjamin uh, wrote three versions of it. That's how important he thought it was. But one of the ideas that he offers in this essay is the idea of the optical unconscious. And uh, he was eager to, kind of, I think, to kind of theoretically unify his approach. Um, so he uh, sees this as an analog to psychoanalysis. But at any rate, he wrote that whereas it is a commonplace um, that we have some idea of what is involved in walking, we have no idea at all what happens during the fraction of the second a person actually takes a step. So he he really understood how photography and Arago did as well um, in the quotation that was on a, a previous slide that photography's uses would be would would be unimaginable, unpredictable, um, and would open up a whole new world of discovery. And indeed, that is what it happened. And um, so it's this idea that with slow motion, high speed photography, and the extension of the technologies uh, in scale, microphotography, um, astrophotography, that we would discover what was hitherto unknown to human beings. And uh, in that respect, photography, the initial uh, uh, infatuation with the daguerreotypes was just sort of uh, a flirtation compared with what was to come. Well, Daguerre wasn't the only uh, person investigating photography. Um, there were a number of folks working on it. In Britain, um, William Henry Fox Talbot, who was uh, who had a scientific background and uh, as well as an artistic uh, bent, um, was investigating photographic effects. And he was able, using a fine writing paper, coating it with salt and brushing it with a solution of silver nitrate, to make what he called photogenic drawings. And after he learned about uh, Daguerre's achievements, he, he redoubled his efforts and he came up with a way of making negatives. And in so doing, he created 
he was the first to to use what we now know is the positive negative process it's the basis of analog photography that um, has been used ever since talbot discovered it and it, it really was uh, a great leap forward um, and uh, a very important development he called these prints callotypes from the greek word for beautiful and uh you can see that it really was um, quite an achievement. So I won't read all this. You're welcome to, to read it. But I just want to talk a little bit about um, the um, incremental developments that would occur. Uh, um, the wet plate collodion process was uh, another advancement. Um, and one thing that was very important about creating a negative was a daguerreotype was one of a kind. It was the one off. There was no way to duplicate a daguerreotype. And so for that reason, it was kind of a, uh, a uh, an intermediary step to true photography as we know it. Whereas when Talbot invented uh, the negative, any number of prints could be made from one negative, positive prints could be made from one negative. And this really ushered in uh, mechanical or technological reproducibility, the ability to make any number of pictures from one negative. And uh, with the uh, wet plate collodion process, um, you sort of had the best of both worlds, at least for a while, you had the resolution of the daguerreotype and the ability to make prints from a negative, just like the callow type. So it quickly became at least a pretty good competitor to get daguerreotypes. And ultimately, daguerreotypes would become more of a curiosity. And there were variations of the collodion process, but the basic process was the same. In the 1870s, uh, the wet plate process, which necessitated carrying around uh, all sorts of toxic chemicals, and and it just wasn't good to use in the field. The wet plates were replaced by gelatin dry plates, glass plates with photographic emulsion um, coating uh, coating the glass. So, uh, and then the perhaps you know the most important of all in 1884. Uh, George Eastman developed a dried gel on paper or film uh, technology, which enabled film to be rolled up, sold in packs, and um, of course the rest we're familiar with. Um, the Brownie camera um, ultimately came along in which, um, again, revolution, revolutionized uh, photography further. Any questions at this point about uh, Photography, if I I may have any anything that needs clarification, feel free at any time to uh, to put a question forward. No questions have been shared uh, in the chat, Clay, but anyone is welcome to come off mute and ask Clay directly if you'd prefer. Okay, we'll just keep going here. Um, well, let's go back to. Walter Benjamin and talk about his um, his idea of the uh, whoops I got to go backward here uh, about the original and aura and why is it such a big deal actually to uh, to make copies uh, we take it for granted that all we have to do is hit a button on our computer and we have as many copies of something as we have sheets of paper in the printer or we can buy more paper but um, the way Benjamin saw art, well, first of all, he saw that people were waste, had wasted a lot of time arguing about whether photography was or was not an art, was it not a fine art, when what they should have been thinking about, according to Benjamin, was that this ability to make copies and perfect reproductions uh, of an existentially unique event or time 
would change the character of art entirely. So it wasn't, it was a much bigger question. And he saw art objects as having originally a ritual or cult, as he put it, significance. Uh, if you think of uh, um, altar pieces uh, in um, European churches, which are some of our most significant historical works of art, they had a ritual cult significance. They had a particular location and space and time. And that's, and he called that the aura. That was, um, that was a part of where, what the object was. It's, it was, I guess in, in Marxist terms or Marxian terms, it would have been its use value at the time. But as he put it, the difference between the copy and the original is unmistakable. Um, the peeling away of the object shell, the destruction of the aura is the signature of a perception whose sense for the sameness of things has grown to the point where even the singular, the unique, is divested of its uniqueness. And I think he was thinking about modern culture, culture of the 20th century, and the proliferation of images and copies, not just of visual works of art, but also sound and, of course, motion pictures. So to use this as an example, we have um, Leonardo's uh, Gioconda. Um, it's not a perfect example because the ritual value or the original uh, cult significance of Gioconda, um, I think Le Leonardo kept this painting for himself and then he, as I understand it, willed it to uh, his amanuensis. But the point is, it has been reproduced so often now that it has gone far beyond uh, exponentially beyond its original time and place and lost that aura, its original significance as an art object. So photography, by virtue of its mechanical reproducity, reproducibility and its mimetic fidelity, liberated the work of art from its ritual cult seclusion, its particular original location in time and place to now appear throughout popular culture in a variety of contexts and media. Anybody uh, subject, I suppose, to copyright laws, which it's a whole nother topic, but could use a copy of a picture of uh, uh, the Mona Lisa, for instance. And this process, uh, Benjamin saw, destroyed the aura, which was dependent on the original ritual significance of the art object. And we see one of the, in Andy Warhol's, uh, um, work. Uh, Warhol understood this, that's a whole nother uh, area, but he really understood how making copies of images would, is sort of the hallmark of our own culture. <clears throat> so, Photography swept Paris, it swept uh, London, and one of the early uh, Parisian photographers, uh, Eugène Atchet, um, was a really important practitioner and gave a lot of images that we now really hold as, as very important. The photograph had a new ontological way of being in the world, a new sense of being because in contrast to a painting the photograph is a visual it's a light print of a particular moment in time the, the 100th or the 1 500th of a second period that the that the lens the shutter is open and the light from that event hits the film or the plate or whatever the light sensitive uh, substance might be and so it this may seem in some ways like a minor point, may seem uh, perhaps uh, splitting hairs, but I think it was, and it was understood viscerally, if not completely consciously at the time, to be a completely new way of making, of, of understanding what was going on in the world. Um, 
and uh, Roland Barthes gets the essay, the French essayist gets at this in in his uh, book Camera Lucida. <laughs> Excuse me. And Bart also understood that painting perhaps is more akin to theater than it is to painting. And um, we could discuss that. I think that would be an interesting thing for us to discuss why that may or may not be the case. So keep that in mind. And I would love to have a discussion about that. But meanwhile, remember that the art world was proceeding apace and uh, um, while the invention of wall photography was sweeping uh, the developed world. Um, um, Gustave Courbet, um, a, a very important painter at the time uh, in the early 19th century, was highly influenced, not just by photography, but by a, a sort of an, a romantic approach, which he may have felt needed to be called realism, but he was interested in seeing things in a photographic way. And I think this very important painting, A Burial at Ornan uh, from 1850, illustrates this. And uh, unfortunately, or I guess it's immaterial now, at the time, his work was very, was somewhat controversial. Uh, this critic, De Place here, I've quoted, pans it by saying, the innovation, however, does not lie in the quirk of inflating scenes of everyday life to such vast proportions. The intention of the work here, perfectly realized, is to reproduce as if by means of a giant color daguerreotype, the entire cortege and its most literal vulgarity. So um, de Place may feel that he's panning it, but I'm sure Corbet might have said, yeah, that's kind of part of what I'm trying to do here, but of course, more in the sense that it that he was engaging his understanding of Ornan and his which was his home. But uh, you can see that this was a different sort of painting from history painting. And uh, um, but it owed something to photography um, and the ability to look at vernacular scenes and uh, and see the individuals and each one having a particular uh, role in this event. Here's a, another uh, piece by Courbet from the same time, a similar time. And in this painting, Courbet's three, sis three sisters are out for a walk. And uh, this was shown at the 1852 Salon and it was ridiculed as tasteless and clumsy. and um, Corbet did a number of uh, series uh, of pictures devoted to the lives of women, which in itself would have been controversial at the time. I think you can see in the, you know, it, it's, it's a, while perspective is important, um, uh, the painting has a flatness to it that, a lot of the calculated history paintings and did not have. So photography arrived in a world already uh, sort of um, uh, in in uh, in play in terms of the avant-garde and how this was all going to be sorted out. Um, you remember that the annual salons were incredibly important for painters. If you were accepted at, at one of the annual salons, uh, which were sponsored by the French government, that would be a ticket to a successful career. If you were, if your work did not make it into the salon, you were consigned to a lesser rank as, as a painter. Um, at the Salon des Refusés, uh, which you remember was started by those whose work was not accepted by the Salon and it was initiated in 1863 by uh, Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, Manet exhibited, exhibited Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, the um, luncheon on the grass. And uh, this was uh, a revolutionary painting. And, um, 
hopefully we can talk a little bit about this as well. But uh, <clears throat> you can see, well, one thing that's important is that uh, Manet was placing himself in a tradition. Uh, he was thinking about, uh, there was a painting by Giorgio uh, going back centuries. So this motif of um, people on sitting on a grassy knoll, uh, the use of the figure, was uh, probably not so much controversial as we might think. Um, what was controversial about it was the flatness of the painting, and which was interpreted as uh, not being technically able to manage what other painters were able to do. Um, but Zola, who was a supporter of Manet, um, understood what Manet was trying to do, or at least thought he understood anyway. And um, he says, compared with our historical and genre painters, our modern landscape artists have achieved much more. Um, in a slam, it kind of slams history painting Manet. Uh, instead of trying to compose a new picture about the death of Caesar or Socrates drinking hemlock, he quietly places some objects or poses some people in a corner of his studio and begins to paint. And uh, Art has practiced by him leads to ultimate truth. This artist is an interpreter of things as they are. And for me, his works have the great merit of being accurate descriptions rendered in an original and human language. So Manet would have been influenced by photography, but he, he was internalizing this and realizing that art itself was changing and achieving a certain type of uh, illusion or window into a new world was not what art was so much about anymore. In contrast, uh, we have mid 19th century French academic painting, um, which was sort of carrying on uh, with what had been traditionally regarded as Beaux-Arts work. Uh, Jerome and the death of Caesar, um, which, uh, uh, Zola was referring to in, in that quote. Um, and of course, Bougereau, we still see Bougereau's paintings in museums when we go to the Art Institute or uh, any, he, he's sort of representative of the establishment at the time in the 19th century. And his work sort of has a, almost a, um, a soft porn kind of look to it, but this was what um, what people at least the academicians thought was proper painting. So you can you can see that Manet's work, Courbet's work, would have come across um, as uh, tasteless, as uh, poorly executed. Um, and the theoretical side of it, or the the change in the character of art itself, would have been would would have been passed, uh, not understood. So how did how did artists um, react to photography? I mean, we've we've talked about um, the audiences. We've talked about the daguerreotype. What did leading artists of the time think? And of course, it was all over the place, really. Um, Delacroix, a lot like uh, the American Thomas Aikens, saw it as a way of improving his understanding of anatomy and movement. Um, Degas, as we will see also uh, later on, looked at photography as a way of improving his understanding of how um, horses move, how humans moved. Um, so uh, he accepted and then saw, well, this will make me a better, make my project better, make my results better. Um, Courbet and Angra apparently commissioned photographs as references for their large paintings. Later, Degas used photography to root search horses' motions for his pieces. And in the United States, I mentioned Aikens, likewise embraced photography as a way of researching form and motion. Um, we'll talk about uh, Moybridge and Marais and their researches on uh, motion, animals in motion. Um, and that was 
extending this technology even further, of course. So photography ultimately, whether painters chose to see this is not see this or not, freed painters from the burden of creating likenesses. If one wanted an objective portrait, a daguerreotype or a, a you know a wet plate or dry plate portrait would have been uh, the way to go. And in fact, this is what happened. Portraiture, photographic portrait portraiture exploded in the mid nineteenth century and on. Um, for the reasons that we've discussed. It, it was a particular moment. You could uh, see your loved ones and have their images, faithful images, um, and a particular moment in time uh, there for you to look at for the rest of your life. So in a way, very important way, photography thus freed artists to explore subjectivity. Again, we talked about um, the change in the world in um, uh, aesthetics and the criteria of representation. Freed artists to interpret nature more truly in the spirit of the person or landscape in front of the artist. Um, Lady Elizabeth Eastlake, who was a British um, essayist and, and critic, wrote, photography is intended to supersede much that art has hitherto done but only that which it was both a misappropriation and a deterioration of art to do. And that in many ways is one of the most profound statements about photography and art. I'll read it again. Photography is intended to supersede much that art has hitherto done, but only that which it was both a misappropriation and a deterioration of art to do. So she understood um, so much, uh, perhaps uh, intuitively, about where art would proceed um, in the wake of the development of photography. And as I mentioned, Benjamin uh, would write in his uh, Mechanical Reproducibility essay, commentators had expended much fruitless ingenuity on the question of whether photography was an art with ask, without asking the more fundamental question of whether the invention of photography had not transformed the entire character of art. So these folks got it, um, that art was being profoundly changed, fundamentally changed. Meanwhile, we talked about portraiture. Portraiture uh, mushroomed. Um, one of the things that happened in the mid 19th century is that uh, carte de visite visiting photographic visiting cards became a huge business uh, and uh, it was really the industrialization of photography uh, particularly in France although these cards were um, uh, were popular all over the western world um, here's a, a quotation from a, um, a Metropolitan Museum of Art essay on French photography after 1860 um, Disdary popularized the system by which eight exposures could be made on one glass negative. And so millions of these portraits were produced. Here's an example. Um, and it was, again, they were sort of selfies at the time, I suppose. We could make that analogy and we know how many selfies are probably out there. So according to Helmut Gernsheim, it was stated that 33,000 people made their living from the production of photographs and photographic materials in Paris alone in the summer of 1861. So this was a craze um, which followed the daguerreotype Bomania as it was uh, perceived a little bit earlier. One of the most famous French photographers at the time was uh, Gaspar Félix Ternachon, who was known as Nadar. And we have him to thank for a number of the uh, great images we have of uh, intellectuals and artists at the time. Baudelaire, Monet, uh, Rossini, musician. I mean, uh, it's, it's a real treasure trove. Uh, he, he was a really interesting uh, person. He was a balloonist, novelist, journalist, caricaturist.
And another figure a little bit later on in the 19th century was Eugène Atier. And around 1890, he hung a shingle out that read document for artists, documents for artists on a studio door in Paris's fifth arrondissement. And so he went around taking pictures of things that other folks might have neglected to think were worthy of photographs. As Benjamin uh, remarked, he was attracted to what was unremarked or forgotten. His work was very influential um, uh, in amongst surrealists. Uh, so many of his paintings don't have very few or, or no figures in them. And he really understood Paris. And uh, so there was quite a, he was quite influential in that, in the surrealist movement. Let's talk a few minutes about something we're gonna revisit next week, which is uh, the study of motion um, using photography. And really the advancements that were made kind of staggering when you think that it only been a few decades before that um, uh, Niepce had made a bitumen of Judea print that took eight hours to expose. And here uh, was Etienne Jules Marais making um, photographic studies of birds flying and horses trotting. Um, Edward Muybridge, who arguably was the first to really get involved in the study of uh, the photographic study of motion, uh, could be the subject of a HASP course on his own. I, I can't even begin to cover his interesting life. Um, uh, and maybe if we have time, we can talk about him. But uh, he was born Edward James Muggeridge in Britain. He uh, ultimately became a photographer um, and specialized in photography in the Western United States at one point. And that was how Leland Stanford, um, the former governor of California and a horse enthusiast um, found him and hired Moybridge to create an instantaneous photographs of one of his horses at full speed. Um, there was the question of whether all four of the horse's hooves left the ground at any point in the horse's um, stride. And uh, so Moybridge took on the challenge and set up 12 cameras and um, uh, in fact found out that, that yes, at one point, all four did come off the ground. But uh, both of these men, while well-known, I guess, to specialists, don't have the sort of everyday, uh, their names aren't, aren't household uh, recognized names, but uh, extremely important um, in uh, anatomical research at the time. And of course, ultimately, um, as progenitors of motion picture photography. Here's um, a composite of uh, Moybridge's uh, images of the horse trotting or galloping, I guess. So that's um, images uh, at one to 11 from 1878 by Moybridge. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, artists reacted to, toward, to photography in a couple of different ways, or at least in a variety of ways. One was to embrace it as a way of researching um, their subjects. And in Degas' sent, uh, application, even though his, his uh, pastels shown here were um, were gestural in, in a lot of ways and impressionistic. He was very interested in making sure that the movement and the anatomy of the horses was um, was accurate. So that's that in itself is an interesting observation about what uh, Degas was trying to achieve. And so he availed himself of Moybridge's studies to try to um, get a sense because if you've ever 
tried to sketch a moving animal. Uh, imagine trying to sketch a running deer. I mean, we, these things take a fraction of a second. It's very difficult to isolate just what is going on when. And so um, Moybridge's uh, research and Murray's research was really a boon to these artists. So how did, again, to sort of recap, how did photography affect painting? Some painters saw it as an aid, as I mentioned. Um, Lady Elizabeth Eastlake's uh, observation was, I think, just spot on. Um, however, some folks, uh, Charles Baudelaire in particular, thought that photography, felt that photography was really sort of a nail in the coffin of, um, well, he, he, French artistic genius, but I think he would say of um, the artistic spirit itself. So he, oddly enough, it was reactionary. Um, very important poet, of course, really influential, but um, did not, was not able to move beyond um, his own milieu. Uh, uh, others, for instance, uh, Weirds here, let it not be thought that the daguerreotype kills art. No, it only kills the work of patience and pays homage to the work of thought. Um, so I think some people saw that photography would really change, as we put it, the character of art itself. <clears throat> and here's a painting by Cezanne in which you can see um, the flatness uh, of the picture plane that Cezanne um, produced. And this was in depth, of course, direct contrast to um, what was taught in the art schools at the time. Every picture needed to have um, at least two point, if not three point perspective and an illusion of space and, and so on and so forth. So this was all kind of revolutionary. <clears throat> Here's another painting by, um, by Manet. And uh, I think we can see like Courbet's uh, The Burial at Ornan that what artists, which painters were trying to achieve had changed radically. Um, if in the, you know, in the old days in, in uh, neoclassicism, the leaves on the trees would have been rendered um, very carefully. Uh, we would have had a clear window into perspective here, but now this looks very flat and almost piled up. But the impression of a lot of people in a park is there unmistakably. Well, I wanted to stop here and just maybe start kind of a discussion, um, see if we can get a discussion going about ways that a photographic image might be from a different from a drawing. Um, can you imagine what it was like for people to see exact reproductions of themselves and their loved ones for the first time? If we can somehow strip away our preconceptions and just imagine that. Anybody want to um, venture a thought or a, a reaction or an anecdote about that? You are encouraged to unmute yourself if you'd like to participate in uh, the question posed by Clay. But people also turn their video screens back on so we can see you. That would really help. They are certainly welcome to just uh, uh, check or uh, where you have your camera with a red slash through it. You can click that button so your camera is visible. I see Terry and Sarah Briggs. Either of you would like to comment on uh, Clay's uh, question there. Terry, you, you first. Uh, I have a question about when someone does a portrait, like how long would it take an artist to complete it? When you talk about you know, the, the moment in time, a mm -hmm. photographer can capture that. But when you think of all, I recently watched a Netflix movie, for instance, where they were trying to do a portrait of a king and queen mm -hmm. and it's every day there seemed to be a different affect maybe they had a bad day right. and then does their expression change and then how do you really whereas a photograph it is a moment in time and you can right. change it 
No, that's that's a really good question and and an, an important one. Um, well, I think maybe the short answer, and I'll move on from it, is uh, mm-hmm. it depends on the painter because um, portraiture has evolved over time. But in the mid nineteenth century, the mm-hmm. tradition typically what you'd do is you would you would make some sketches of the person's face in particular from different angles. You would study the person's face how what's with the cheekbones what was what's with the chin how do i understand this because from an artist's point of view a face is i hate to put it this way but is an object in one respect that you're trying to understand and um in another respect of course it's a human visage and you want to um Mm -hmm. portray it accordingly but you know we have noses we have chins we have mouths, each one is slightly different. And as you pointed out, the expressions can change. Um, so to answer your question, I, I, there's probably no one answer, but it would be, I think particularly for a royal portrait, yeah, it would be days and days. Uh, and um, because there was a lot writing and on the portrait, it was there for posterity, yes. before yes. they mentioned of photography. Um, that would have been that person's uh, record and you think about characteristics like the, um, was it the Habsburg lip or chin, jaw, mm-hmm. you know, the particular characteristics of historical individuals that um, needed to be addressed and uh, carefully if you were an artist, because um, if you didn't please your uh, patron, then you might not get paid, at least not in the way that you would have liked and might not get any more commission. So it would have been a lengthy process. Um, Contemporary, you know, in our time, I mean, I'm thinking of Alice, the painter Alice Neal, late 20th century painter, mid, mid to late. Um, I don't think, I don't know, I don't think it would have been days and days and days for her. I think it was more um, based on a on a, uh, a direct a la prima, so to speak, sketch done in oil. But I don't know that for sure, but I'm just guessing. Good question. Really important. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that whole idea of, of truth in the image is an interesting one. That that quote from Zola that you used, and mm-hmm. you, know, um, you were talking about uh, uh, artists doing portraits, um, and they also could ma- enhance their subject, right? They oh, if yeah. they chose to, um, so they could make a, a woman a little more beautiful than she really was, perhaps. Whereas the photograph. Right didn't lie it was, it right was there um but it's also interesting that that we do seem to still value uh our, our artist portrait uh, our portraits done by artists you know you think of the obama presidential portraits and how much discussion there was about that and how much interpretation went on in making the portraits and then you know people's reaction to them so yeah you know, that hasn't gone away yeah, that's a really good point. And I hadn't to tell you she's really thought about that, but I think it supports um, our our thesis about reproductions because uh, we might, in some ways, we've come full circle to the point where portraits being very expensive and intentional, uh, as opposed to the plethora of images, you know, we have on our phones, um, have, we've come back to that point where a portrait becomes a political uh, a political act, and and this was something Benjamin said would happen as the character of art changed, as it lost ritual significance, it would take on political significance. So it's almost it's kind of eerie that he understood that that that's how it would happen, and uh, or at least that was his impression of how it was happening. And uh, yeah, I mean, think of John Singer Sargent, kind of going back to your point about making people look better. Um, the famous uh, sergeant portraits of, of women, which if you were a society woman in, in Newport, Rhode Island, you had to have a, in the 1890s, had to have a, a, a sergeant portrait done uh, when you were engaged or whatever. And uh, and I'm sure those, well, even though he had incredible facility, I think he may have exercised some artistic license in making uh, a woman look particularly youthful at that time. Uh, to your point. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Jesse Dolman, I see you've come off mute. Did you have a question or a comment to share? 
I'd, I'd like to ask people, do, do you have a sense of why Bart, uh, earlier we talked about um, Roland Bart and his uh, um, observation that painting was more like theater and then it was, I mean, rather photography was more like theater than it was like painting. Do you have a, a sense of why that might be the case? Why he might have observed that? I, I just find that an interesting observation. Well, I'll, I guess I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think he saw that theater, um, like photography, was an existential act that wouldn't, was always about one particular moment in time. In other words, even if an actor wants to play the character the same the next night he or she won't be able to do that it's just impossible for a couple of different reasons he won't be in the exact same place the sound of his or her voice won't be the same so i think bart saw that existentially a photograph was a completely different class of object from a painting whereas a painting um at the very minimum takes an hour or two and you know a, for a gestural sketch and um, just for starters, so, or take years, so. But anyway, I encourage you, if you have any thoughts, or if there's anything that I've said that uh, uh, isn't clear, or you felt has been muddled, or just um, please ask. I, I want to be sure to um, establish a rapport um, on, uh, and be able to address some of these uh, these issues because it is there's sort of a divide that you can cross or uh, when looking trying to put yourself in the shoes of somebody seeing a photograph or a film for the first time and why when the first films were shown of a train arriving at a station people would um, initially leap out of their seats they they were just had never that was just not something that was a part of the human psyche um to have that kind of impression. I have a question. Okay, great. Um, a few years ago, I remember there was an article on the authenticity of photography. It was titled In the Atlantic. And um, with all the manipulation that goes on now, I'm wondering if you're going to be talking about that later in your sessions. <laughs> no, that's that's a really a, a interesting point. And that's um, why early um, when I was introducing the like the first couple of slides, I mentioned that I was really looking forward to the digital, uh, the third session on digital uh, the transition from analog to digital, digital world and what um digital means of representation and communication what they offer us and what perhaps they challenge us with and and i think what you're alluding to is a really real issue um when and i'll just kind of try to capsulize this but when you digitize a photo you turn it into binary code and when push comes to shove, it's just ones and zeros, um, a lot of them. And ultimately that's represented on your computer screen. And um, if you wanna remove a branch from a photo of a bird in Photoshop, you can use the clone stamp tool to very effectively get rid of that and change the, improve the composition of the photo and the impact that the photo makes. Now that same, technology or an extension of it can be used to um, put people in and out of photos. Um, we have a joke in our family that when we take a group photo, and my son-in-law is a photographer, um, he often has to take a photo of his son's head, who's, his son is five, and put it on his body because he might be making a weird face or something. So, um, but you can see the application. Um, in terms of authenticity, what is authentic? And that's one of the reasons why in reasons rather in postmodernism, the whole idea of authenticity um, becomes a very real issue, um, not only um, 
in sort of theoretical terms, but in technological terms. Um, so I don't think there's any easy answer, but I'm glad you raised the question because it shows that you're thinking and that we have something to talk about. And, um, and it's very important. Um, and I think it's connected to everyday life for us, particularly um, today. So yeah, great question. I, I hope we get more questions like that. Um, any, these are some great uh, discussion uh, questions. Anything else going on that people would like to, to bring up? I hope I've been able to um, uh, sort of, I wanted to trace the path of photography as it was being developed without getting bogged down in the, the nitty gritty details of, of how the technology worked, but make the technology uh, and its effects um, traceable, so to speak. Okay, well, we'll move on, but I, please do, um, if something pops into your mind, um, uh, please uh, raise the question because I did want this to be a seminar and uh, um, so we could have some discussions. So we talked about um, how photography liberated painters and uh, as I keep saying it over and over, and you'll have to forgive me, it's hard for us to go back in time and put ourselves in their shoes. But before photographic reproduction, painters had been tasked. This was the primary reason society wanted painters, really, uh, or a primary reason was to make likenesses and to record historical events. Um, not necessarily comment on them, that wouldn't been the legacy so much, but artists found ways, surreptitious ways sometimes to do that, but that wasn't um, what they were really there for. And certain critics saw that. Um, uh, Thanion, the painter of today has been freed by photography, still in motion. So this is a little bit later, of the tedious utilitarian mission which devolved upon his colleagues of yesteryears to reveal to me the exterior and its many details. This is a very telling quotation from uh, a master, Picasso. Quote, when you see what you express through photography, you realize all the things that can no longer be the object of painting. Why should the artist persist in treating subjects that can be established so clearly with the lens of a camera? It would be absurd, wouldn't it? Photography has arrived at the point where it is capable of liberating painting from all literature, from the anecdote, and even from the subject. In any case, a certain aspect of the subject now belongs in the domain of photography. So shouldn't painters profit from their newly acquired liberty to do other things? Um, so there's a lot there in that statement of Picasso's about how photography changed the character of art. And it did, it, in a lot of respects, um, it did change the objective painting. And here the surrealist Louis Aragon wrote, in the future, the photograph will not be the model for the painter in the old sense of academic models, but his documentary aid in the sense in which in our day, files of daily newspapers are indispensable to the novelist. The painter of tomorrow will use the photographer's eye. Um, and that is something you can keep in mind as we move through time, um, or just when you go to a museum, next time you go to a museum, um, see how the eye of the, of the uh, painter changed after the advent of photography. We've seen how Manet saw things differently. Um, you can't, in a way, can we imagine that Monet and his haystacks would have been painted in a different time before the invention of photography? Um, so uh, it's a fruitful way of looking at the history of, of painting, particularly in the last couple of hundred years. Well, we talked about. Um, uh, Etienne, motion picture photography, and Etienne Jules Marais, um, 
and we'll really get into that more next week. But uh, in this, uh, one of uh, Kandinsky's first um, abstractions, uh, you can argue that he has really been affected by motion picture uh, photography, not even, um, obviously not, uh, I mean, we can't put him later than he actually is, but Marais' work, for instance, and the the thrust of the motion in, in these pieces. Um, this is 1912, so we fast forwarded quite a bit, but uh, um, an essayist wrote, what Marais unwittingly bequeathed to modern art was a wholly new set of visual symbols for the representation of time, space, and motion. More accurately, accurately, symbols which transmitted the idea of a synthesis of these states of being. So all the ideas that were um, being pioneered in science, having to do with uh, relativity and uh, electrons and um, space and the vastness of space and time um, were having an effect on, on artists and how they looked at the world. This is really clearly seen, and again, we're fast forwarding um, into the early days of the 20th century, but um, uh, Marcel Duchamp and his new descending a staircase, number two, uh, clearly influenced by uh, Marais researches into uh, human motion. And um, it's uh, again, getting thinking about Benjamin's statement regarding the optical unconscious and um, the body as a machine. Uh, one, you know, one can't help but feel that um, that this is a part of what Duchamp wants to investigate. Um, and of all the people who change the character of art, Duchamp is certainly one of the most important. Well. Um, it's about time to kind of start wrapping this up. And, and again, any questions would be really appreciated because I think it makes, makes this interesting and, and it ensures that I've been of some value to you um, as you uh, consider this topic. Um, photography freed painters from the burden of simply achieving likenesses as we, we, we understand that. Um, we saw how photographic portraiture became hugely popular. And painters and sculptors who were really heirs of the romantic and realistic movements became much freer to pursue their own visions of what it meant to paint. And that's still a topic. Um, how do you paint in an era of photography? It's something that every painter has to, to deal with in some way and some struggle with it. I In a, a cover article on the New York Review of Books recently talked about that very issue. Um, how do you paint? Are you um, are you painting in abstraction, that point of view, or are you painting as a as a so-called realist? And um, how how do you how do you deal with that? So these are all important um, important questions. Indeed, impressionism, post-impressionism, and other movements would not have been possible, and I have to be careful how I say this, without the growth of photography. Um, and so we can see that Benjamin, um, Lady Eastlake, other folks who looked at photography at the time and understood what was going on were, were really correct, that we're, we're really in tune, I should say, with what was going on with art in general. Um, uh, you can't imagine Cezanne painting Mont Saint Victoire over and over again um, when he could have just had a picture of it. Um, it's, sort of, it's sort of beside the point. It's painting before the motif um, grew even as photography grew because it painting in some ways became more pure 
as a result of photography taking on some of the burden as Picasso uh, pointed out. And then we'll see next week that uh, the development of photography and sound recording um, only sort of deepened this uh, opening up of not just the optical unconscious, but the unconscious period. Um, you think about what was going on in literature um, with Marcel Proust, James Joyce, H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, Ralph Bellamy's Looking Backward. Um, all looked at time as a, as a flexible, plastic, traversable element in our lives in photography and sound, which were sort of rudimentary time machines, um, reinforced this. Um, even, even playwrights, Ibsen's play, such as The Dollhouse, uh, exploring how past and future were so organically in, intertwined. Archaeological discoveries, uh, um gave human beings it challenged the the traditionally the traditional notion of what the human past was and of course perhaps the the most significant darwin's and wallace's understandings of the mechanisms of evolution or the results of evolution even if they didn't understand the genetic basis of it because it hadn't been discovered yet all this gave human beings uh it expanded our horizons tremendously. Um, and of course, at the same time, mechanization and the Industrial Revolution accelerating uh, uh, created even more anxiety. And then, of course, you have the 20th century and uh, some cataclysmic, catastrophic global events such as World War I and, and beyond. But uh, so that's kind of that's kind of the first session. I hope um, I hope it's been rewarding for you to think about these things. I hope I've um, been coherent and <laughs> been able to uh, trace the development. I hope, are there any questions or things that I've left unclear? This isn't a question, but it's a comment. You get an A plus for your French pronunciation. It was just huh? beautiful to hear everything said correctly. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I try. <laughs> That's the only language I know anything about. That's a good thing none of this was really German. <laughs> um, any thoughts about what people would, are interested in? Um, I mean, I'm hoping everyone will come back uh, for the second and third session. So, yes. Um, so, in the end, so in the end, is photography really considered a true art form? You would compare it to painting and sculpting and... Well, yes, it, it is, but it, that was not without um, controversy. And I didn't, I had to leave out some things. Um, and in, in the mid 19th century, around 1850, it was, it was really an issue. It was really, uh, in fact, at the, I forget which exhibition it was, it might've been it was a world's fair the world. about that time and yeah and um photography was exhibited but it didn't use the same building as the uh paint exhibition of paintings and it oh. wasn't until later oh. mm. that the academy said okay we'll let photographs be considered art but we won't show them together but we'll show them in the same roughly the same place so okay it was and it, i suppose it still is contested by some folks that it's and I think it does boil down to this issue of reproducibility and perhaps the perceived ease of taking a photograph especially now um, you know we pick up our phones and we can take however many photos we want and send them to whoever we want and whomever we want and um, the images now are the air are like the air we breathe. And uh, whereas paintings have maybe regained some of that ritual seclusion that they once um, once lost, were perceived as uh, having lost. So um, good question. And uh, I think it depends on your aesthetic philosophy. I suppose if, uh, if a characteristic, if you decide ahead of time that a characteristic of a work of art is that it has to 
take a long time, has to be in a plastic medium, so on and so forth, that photography might not be as highly valued in your aesthetic uh, scheme. But um, I think it, it, it obviously generally is considered any museum uh, in the art world uh, has a photographic wing or floor someplace. So good question, though. Very good question. Well, I guess we're almost at the end here. Um, I hope to see you all next week. And uh, if you have any, uh, please jot down any questions that you have about um, or might have in the interim about um, film, photography, uh, the invention of uh, or how sound became a part of um, uh, films, very interesting complicated topic and we'll end up i know um sarah was interested in this we'll end up next week's session and we'll look at a uh what was called a soundie which was the ancestor uh or an original uh, uh what we might think of now as a uh, a music and you know music video um so there's a lot to cover and um uh, it's been great doing this i hope uh, you'll all come back and um Please, if you have any other questions, jot them down. Thank you, Clay. Just want to relay some uh, kind words from Mary Voss, who said thank you, and from Barb Manette Goodman, who said that today's presentation was very interesting, provided a new perspective for them. Uh, oh, so good. thank you for your time and for sharing. Oh, we to seeing you all next week. Uh, yeah. Same time, same place. That's next Tuesday at 930 virtually again. We'll be here and ready to uh, begin part two of three with clay and technological revolutions of the arts. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and get out and vote today if you have not been able to yet. It's a beautiful day out there and we hope to see you back in the classroom soon. Take care. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Clay. See you later.